Good day, and today we're looking at uh, the second half of Isaiah, and we're going to be looking at the suffering servant who Christians often identify as Jesus Christ. Um, so this is a, a suffering servant who becomes the king through whom God restores both his covenant people Israel and also the nations, bringing about a renewed hope for all of creation. And Isaiah 53 is a very famous passage, uh, particularly for Christians. Um, and it's a chapter that is often quoted throughout the New Testament. And it says this, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he's opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent. And so he opened not his mouth. And by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was struck. His grave was assigned with the wicked, yet with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. He had made himself an offering for sin, and shall he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see of the anguish of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify the many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoils with the strong because he's poured out all his soul to death and he was numbered with the transgressors. Thus he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressions. So here's a, a very famous passage, which, you know, for Christians, rings of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Jesus is also a, a servant who is despised and rejected by his people. He's acquainted with grief and sorrows. And he did that for you, so that when you're going through your own um, rejection, when you're being acquainted with grief and sorrow, you have a high priest who has also travelled through that same path. He knows what you're going through. He has travelled through that. He also has been rejected by men. He knows what it is to be acquainted with grief and sorrows. He knows what you're feeling and he can understand your pain. We're told he carries the sins of all and that by his stripes we're healed. And this is again for you. He did this for you. All of our sins, all of our wrongdoing, all of the, those times where we get things wrong, do the wrong things, where we search after what will make us feel good rather than what is for the best of others. All those times, he says, I have taken those things upon myself. He's a servant who is oppressed and afflicted. A sacrificial lamb going to the slaughter for us. John in Revelation speaks of the lamb who is slain before the foundations of the world. This has always been God's plan to make a way for humanity through the Lord Jesus Christ, to unite all things, Paul says, in heaven and earth under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That he was buried in a rich man's tomb and that he has become an offering of sin. An offering of sin. 
we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But he deviles the spoils with the strong. It's this wonderful victory of the one who suffers is then also raised in glory, where he can then distribute good gifts to his followers, because he's the one who's won a victory, and therefore he's dividing the spoils. But the way that he wins a victory isn't through force of might or for power, but through death and triumphing over death itself, turning death inside out. Over the last... Uh, few messages I've been talking about how history is viewed in light of the end and how we see the cross and the resurrection and then we work backwards from that and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 1 to 4 Paul writes this he says now brothers I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you which you've received and in which you stand through it you are saved if indeed you keep it in memory what I preach to you unless you've believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, what I also received, how Christ died for our sins in accordance to the scriptures. He was buried, rose again in accordance with the scriptures. <clears throat> so Paul's message here, the good news that he's wanting to proclaim, is that Christ has died for our sins according to the scriptures. It's explained through the lens of the scriptures. Without the scriptures, You've got a man who died and then came back to life again. But that is explained through the lens of, according to the scriptures. And so that is the, the way of understanding what these events mean. As I said before, if you just have a video camera on Good Friday, what do you see? You just see another rebel being crucified, being held in, you know, ironic terms the king of the jews you know that's what he called himself but his roman imperial power look we've killed him because he claimed to be a king and now he's dead that's what you would see okay christ jesus of nazareth a carpenter's son now nailed to a cross okay that, that is what you would see a carpenter's son now killed nailed to a cross for claiming to be a king that is what you would see then in the light of the resurrection and then the opening of the scriptures, we now see, oh, this is what it meant. OK, that he's wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, that the sins of us all were upon him. That's according to the scriptures. The scriptures unveil the mystery of what it is. Good Friday and Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday are all about. You wouldn't see it on the camera. You don't see death being trodden down. You don't see the sins of the world being played upon him. You don't see that in the camera. But the scriptures reveal what that is about. So, again, I'm not talking about the New Testament here. We're just talking about the Old Testament. We're talking about, you know, the Torah, these, the Psalms, the books of wisdom and, you know, the prophets. These things unveil for us what the Jesus Christ event, as it were, is all about. They point to him, and Jesus says that, the scriptures point to me, or the scriptures testify of me. That, that's the purpose of the scriptures. They're here to tell us about the Messiah, to reveal him in all of his glory, that we now know him in the light of the scriptures. Before we knew him otherwise, now we know him in light of the scriptures of who he was. So Acts 8 verses 34 to 37 we read the eunuch said to philip i ask you of whom does the prophet speak and he's reading this isaiah passage is it himself or someone else and philip spoke and beginning with that same scripture the one we're looking at this morning he preached jesus to him and when they were on their way they came to some water and the eunuch said look here is water what hinders me from being baptized and philip said if you believe in all your heart you may and he answered i believe that jesus christ is the son of god so here we have philip uh, the evangelist and he's come here and he's met this ethiopian eunuch on on the road and he's reading the isaiah scroll he's reading this passage that we're looking at this morning and philip uses this passage to then speak about jesus christ that this man the carpenter's son or however you want to say this is what he really was according to the scriptures that he was died 
and rose again in accordance with the scriptures. That is how we understand that that's the context for which we now view these events, that it is in accordance with the scriptures. And the whole story of the scriptures is the story of exile and exodus. I've mentioned this before. These two big themes are exile away from God and then our exodus out from under the powers and authorities from the lands of darkness into now the promised land, back into the presence of God. And it's your story and it's also my story. All of us um, have our own exile. All of us have our own exile and we've all got our own way of coming back into the presence of God. We've all got our own testimonies, our own stories, our own histories that, that talk about how we've come out of darkness into light, out from under these other powers into the story of God. It's the story of Adam and Eve. It's the story of Cain being exiled as well. It's the story of Israel as well in their own exile and also their exodus out of Egypt and out of Babylon, out of the nations back into the promised land. In Romans chapter 11 verse 36, Paul writes, For from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And that's the whole grand story of history is that it's from him, through him, and then ultimately back to him um, in that exile and exodus story. How God redeems us, how God brings us back out from our bondage, out from the darkness that we find ourselves in. Isaiah here is dealing with the, the, the exile. He's dealing with the exile of the northern kingdom, the exile of the southern kingdom. He's living in the, the time frame of the exodus and he's prophesying about it and the restoration. And the servant deals with the exile of all of humanity from Eden, from God's presence, from, from Adam and Israel. Both Adam and Eve and Israel are exiled from the west into the east. They go from there into the east, out of God's presence. And that's why the temple is orientated the way it is, that you approach from the east and then go west, so that you go back into the Garden of Eden. You know, the temple is designed to be this garden. You know, it's all in gold. You've got the, the menorah as this tree of life. And then you go back into, through the veil of the the, the cherubim that God had placed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden into the Holy of Holies. And so you go from the east, from the place of exile, into the presence of God. And that is what the servant of the Lord here is doing. He's ending our exile. And that's why we see in the Gospels they speak of the, the they speak of the the curtain being torn in two the curtain being torn in two and, that, and that's symbolic of us now being able to go back into the presence of God. So God is love and God desires for all of humanity to come back to him. He's seeking and saving the lost and Adam and Eve are all of our story. All of us are Adam and Eve in that sense. Uh, Adam's name means human and Eve's name means life and they talk about human life. They talk about how all of us have taken for ourselves um, our own way of doing things to define good and evil in our own terms and not according to the ways of God. We're all rebellious at hearts and through Adam death has entered into human experience and all of us die and all of us like Adam choose to sin. And we forget what God is like. We are disloyal. We're unworthy of entering back into his presence. All of us have chosen to go our own way, to do our own thing, to define good and evil as we would like. And yet the father who loved us sent us his son 
to gather the family back together, to clean us up and wash us off, you know, to, to cleanse us and to remove all the dirt from us and take it out of the camp, away from the place. And that's the Day of Atonement picture, you know, that the sins are placed onto the goat and then it's taken out of the camp and not put into the into the desert. And then the people, the city is now holy, it's a holy place because sin has been taken out outside the walls of the city. And that's why Christ dies outside of the city walls and he's led through the streets of Jerusalem. And he's beaten with sticks, just as the goat is that's carrying the sins. And Peter in Acts 2, 20, 32 to 33 says, God has raised this Jesus to life. And we're all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So the one who removes sin now reigns in glory and gives us the right to be adopted as his sons and daughters of the Father. And we're offered a place in his family. Isaiah 53 verses 11 to 12. We shall see the anguish of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify the many, for he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great and shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and he was numbered with the transgressors. Thus he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. I, I just love this image and this picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as it's revealed to heart us here in Isaiah. So the death of Christ is according to the scriptures. OK, so we understand it through the lens of the scriptures. And he says, my righteous servant shall justify the many. He shall bear their iniquities. So that's how we understand what Christ has done, that he's taken all of our wrongdoing. He's taken it upon himself and removed it from us so that we now can receive the Holy Spirit, that we can be a pure vessel wherein God can dwell so that his presence may be in us, so that we can then live his work life and his uh, place in the world. Uh, he says, I will divide him a portion with the great. He will divide the spoils among the strongs. This is the risen, crucified Lord now reigning in glory, dividing up his spoils, his winnings, giving them to his followers, dividing them up. And the way that it's portrayed by Paul is that he pours out the gifts of, from the Spirit to his subjects. So the risen Lord gives good gifts to many is in him pouring out the Spirit upon all of his followers. And it says he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. And I think that's a it's a wonderful thought to know that this man who is acquainted with grief, who suffered much, who has been despised and rejected by many, now reigning at the right hand of God the Father, he now makes intercession for us. He prays and intercedes for you because he knows what it's like to be where you've been. He's been there and now he can pray and intercede before the Father for you from a place of knowing exactly what you're going through. So in conclusion, friends, I'm just going to read a verse from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. He did it once for all time, removing the sins of the world, and now reigning in glory, he will return to put the world to right. And we have that hope that although we might be going through times of suffering, times of pain, uh, not knowing why things are happening the way they are, that Christ is reigning, he's ruling, and one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and God will become all in all. It's a wonderful thought. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you will be with us, that you will strengthen us, that you would watch over us, and we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen and comfort us today. Help us to know that Christ prays and intercedes for us before you, Heavenly Father. Amen.